again. Oh, yes. Make me over again. San Antonio and Global Listeners, we'd like to thank you for tuning in to KROBFM.com. Thank you, Nina, out of Ohio, yes, for stepping in for me this morning. Every morning on Sundays, you're doing an awesome job. But San Antonio, we're going to shift gears right now from Ohio to right here in San Antonio, Texas. My guest today, right along with the twins, <laughs> we're talking about Pastor Antoine Piper. Yes, Pastor Piper was licensed to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ, March 2010. He has been called to serve God in many facets, individually and collectively. God has blessed Antoine to go on numerous ministry trips to Africa and Panama. Antoine is currently the pastor of Destiny Center House of Worship right here in the San Antonio area. Yes, that's Cibolo, Texas, serving with his beautiful wife of nine years. Miss Piper, <laughs> we're going to be talking more about two uh, Mr. Piper right now. Mr. Piper, Pastor Piper, Dr. Piper. Can I say Bishop? Hey. <laughs> you speak of prophetic. Lord, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. <laughs> well, I'd like to say thank you and also introduce introduce the twins, if you will. Um, well, if everybody know they need no introducing of themselves, but I thank God that God has blessed me uh, in the ministry to have the wonderful, wonderful, thunderous twins of dynamite, <laughs> dunamis, power, glory to God, Stephanie and Daphne Webster. It's just a blessing to have them. They are servants. First, Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm telling you, any pastor will be just uh, thankful of the Lord if you had two of these wonderful servants to serve with you. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, uh, yes. Ladies, before we start with pastor, would you like to say something? I, I, I'm Daphne and I would like to say something. I just say thank you first and foremost for this opportunity and I just like to tell the world that we have an awesome pastor and he's a great leader and he honors God and he serves God and it's an honor to follow him and his first lady uh, because they are very centered and very disciplined and they are committed to the yes of following Christ and following God so it's an honor to be here with him and to promote his book and to let others know about Pastor Piper and Destiny Center House of Worship. So, okay. And yes, and that he don't just talk the talk, he walk the walk. And as she said, he's a very disciplined and he's one heartbeat with God and allow the Holy Spirit to lead him everywhere he go. And he just fall in the, in the line of the Holy Spirit. And as God say go, that's what he does. And he's teaching us, his disciples, his uh, followers, his, uh, his members, his uh, house, his flock, do the same thing. So, as the Lord leads us, that's where we go. Stephanie, Daphne <laughs> has spoken. <laughs> oh, yes, Pastor Piper. Yes. You've written a book. Oh, Lord. Lord. It's not about so much of what you feel or what you think, but you've been inspired yes, sir. by God to write The Streets Calling. Help me not to listen. Talk to us, Pastor. Man, uh, man, man, I praise God first off for being done. Glory to God. <laughs> the anointing had to strengthen me on that. But it's just a blessing uh, when God put this up on my heart. Um, one of the pastors I know from Dallas, Texas, New Direction, Pastor Lust, he called me one day. He said, man, I don't know, man, but God told me that, man, you're supposed to write something. Uh, kind of like a book. He gave me kind of like the out, kind of like an outline, and, and the Lord had already been speaking to me about it, and that just convicted my heart of saying, "Why are you procrastinating? Why are you being idle?" And God really showed me a revelation of when you're idle, you're you're hurting someone else. Sometimes we think of procrastination as just hurting us, but God showed me other people that were being hurt simply because I didn't write the book. Mm -hmm. They were suffering because of my idleness. So I told God and surrendered and said, yes, Lord. And he put this up on my heart to write a book to allow people to help them because everybody, 
what God gave you is everybody has this craving, this desire inside of them. The book of James says that we have this desire. We're enticed by our desire. So everybody has this craving. And what that craving does, it takes you down a street. It takes you down a street because that craving is connected to your desire. And in that desire, it calls you to something. That means you get addicted to something. You get attached to something. And the Lord told me is that people need help to get off that street. So whatever street you're on, this book is designed to help you get off that street. But first, you have to recognize what's calling that street. And when I allow you to, because it's 31 chapters and the first 20 chapters is... The first 20 chapters is to let you recognize what street is calling, and then the last 11 is to help you get off that street. Okay. Well, you know, what I love about it is starting off, the street's calling. You're talking about in chapter one. Is it worth it? Mm. Is it worth what? <laughs> <laughs> when you look at some of the things that you give your life to, some of the things that you sacrifice, some of the things that has uh, been first or put in, in your life and you dedicated yourself to it. Sometimes we don't ask ourselves, is it worth it? Okay. We don't ask ourselves, is the very thing that I'm giving my time to, this relationship that I'm pouring my heart to, all these things, the things that I'm living for, the things that I'm going after, is it really worth it? Will it get Will I receive what I'm really looking for? Or do I find myself at the end only realizing that I thought this was going to be, but only come to the end that it was not even worth it. Hmm. We waste so much time of giving ourselves to things. We waste so much time giving ourselves to people only in the end to find out it wasn't even worth it. So the qu first question before we even get it is for, first to, uh, for, for us to first examine ourselves to ask ourselves, let's take an examination of our life. What am I, the things I'm connected to, the things I'm giving our time to, I'm, it's coming and I have a, a projection of where it's going to go. But the question is, do I realize, is it even worth it? And sometimes we don't realize it until it's too late. You know, there's some conversations that we enter into that we really don't have to enter into. Because sometimes there's a lot of arguments that goes on. But the question is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? <laughs> you know, the, um, and that's very true. That's very true. Is it worth it? And I like what you said about do a self-examination. You know, and that's one of the things that I have to find myself. I was sharing with a friend the other day. There's, because there, there's some things that, you know, being here on the radio gives me an opportunity to do quite a bit. But... There's some things that you can get involved into that you shouldn't get involved into. And then when you make, when you say, oh, this was a mistake, but you have to stop and ask, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And in everyday living, there's in families, again, as I said, arguments and jobs and, you know, a lot of things that we go through. We try to take shortcuts when we shouldn't take shortcuts. And then, like, would it have been worth it if I had it just went this way instead of going this way? Come on, now. you know, amen. And but let's look at chapter two, keeping it real. Now, a lot of people. Now, we live in a day and time that people think that they're keeping it real. But hey, I'm just being me. I'm just real. But you bringing it out, keeping it real. Share with us. Like you said, that's a popular term in the world, keeping it real. And in the world, we've identified with things, the way we've raised, friends, movies, whatever it is, and it has given us this understanding of real. So real to me may be, well, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm from West Dallas. So in keeping it real, I have to do certain things, and that in itself tells me that I'm real. Me not doing this, that tells me that I'm real. I talk to one of my friends, I get counsel from them, and that kind of tells me that I'm real, that everybody else loves me, and that in itself tells me I'm real. Or I accumulate 
a certain type of money, then I'm keeping it real. Or if I give myself to something or give money away to an organization, oh yeah, that's keeping it real. If I get to this place in life and I'm able to uh, look out for those that looked out for me, then that's keeping it real. So everybody in the world has a definition of keeping it real. But the question I ask in the second chapter is, is that really real? Because all of us have this understanding of real, but that don't mean it's real. Because real, we don't have the, a correct understanding, so that what we think is real is really a virtual reality. It's really not real. But I can live my life, all my life, to thinking something, trying to keep it real, not only to realize I haven't really kept it real. Then the question must come, what is keeping it real? Keeping it real is the from the realest person to ever walk this earth is Jesus Christ. He sets the definition of what real is. So when he sets the definition of what real is, I measure up to realness of how real I am to him. So if I look at my life through the lens of him, it shows me how real I am or it shows me how real I'm not. But the problem is we have a misconception of real because it's measured by the wrong standard. So you can be keeping it real to something and you're really not keeping it real at all. Because if you have this concept of keeping it real and keeping it real is, man, I'm going to keep it 100. As as my young people say, I'm going to keep it 100. or I'm going to keep it 1000. But yet when I look at your relationship with God, you have yet to keep it 100 with him. He got to beg and plead for you just to talk to him. And some of us ain't even gave our life to him. Well, why? If he kept it that real with you and you have an understanding of real, then the question becomes, how can you not keep it real with him by dying to your own life? Hold up, wait a minute. I got to ask this question. I gotta, cause maybe you can ask a question <laughs> that I've been wondering for years. Come on now. Okay. Now, you grew up in West Dallas. Yes, sir. All right. Let's see. North Dallas yeah. has a different mentality than West Dallas. Yes. South Dallas has a different mentality than West Dallas. Yes. Old Cliff has a different mentality than West Dallas. Oh, yes, sir. Now, I lived in Dallas, <laughs> but I was afraid to go to West Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I just got to know, how did you make it through West Dallas? I'm going to tell you that. Uh, and gonna... those of you that are listening right now, West Dallas Back in the day, was a place where you had a lot of crime, you had a lot of uh, drug addicts, and uh, yeah, drug addicts, and uh, you you call it. It was in West Dallas, <laughs> and it shifted to Old Cliff. <laughs> but how did you make it? I'm gonna tell you that uh, looking at West Dallas, I'm from West Dallas, Rupa Circle, a specific part, and. Throughout that lifestyle and throughout that time, I saw a lot of things. And my motivation was to one day be a hustler, what we call somebody who hustles drugs or who like a kingpin in the streets. That was my motivation. My motivation was um, to live the utmost in that environment. And living in the utmost in that environment is know doing the worst of the worst but I didn't see it like that because that's the culture I was brought up in that's what I always saw I looked up to my cousin and my cousin I remember that he went to jail and he dropped out of school in the eighth grade and you know um, people going to penitentiary so I was looking for my chance to go to the penitentiary and look at this mindset that I had because this is the culture that I was raised up in mm-hmm. and I'm gonna tell you when my grandma got kicked out of the projects. Well, you know, long story with that. But I used to be like, man, how in the world are we going to... I mean, my, I, this is all I know. And my mother and my grandmother uh, really kept a hold of us. Um, really, I remember my, my grandmother used to have us read the Lord's Prayer. And I didn't really know too much about uh, God. I know that he was there. And I remember a van used to come through the projects and pick up everybody. And in that van... You know, they would tell, have us go to church, and I ain't know about, I ain't know too much about church then. I used to go because they give out free lunch. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even about the church. I'd be like, oh, they got cake and, and lunch. I'm going. So, um, I remember one day that I was, I was there, and they had an altar call, and I remember I was ten or so, and I went up there to the altar call, but I didn't know what I was doing. 
out there for. And all throughout my life, going through it, going through it, going through it, I remember I was at the end of uh, my life, meaning that I was about to do something in my life uh, that that I saw. It's like God showed me my life was going to end up in a penitentiary or I was getting up dead. And he showed me that. And I said, man, you know what? I'm just going to try one time just to do something else. And I tried that and I tried to go to the army, try to go to that. And they denied me. And I was like, well, you know what you got to do. And I was on my mind to go do something to somebody, you know, uh, just to be real about it. And as I was walking there, you know, somebody came and, and, and talked to me about the Air Force. And I tell you that right then and there, it was a voice calling me. It was a voice calling me to not do it. It was a voice telling me that your life can be something different. It was a voice calling me and it was a distant voice. But I noticed in that voice, other voices were calling, but something was telling me to listen to that voice. Something was telling me to believe. I didn't know what faith was. I didn't know anything about it, but something told me to believe. And I'm telling you, when I listened to that voice, my life changed. And as my life changed, I followed that voice and it changed my life forever. And then God has showed me throughout my life how he'd been talking to me. Even when I was in the projects thinking there was no God, no God showed me that he was always there. You know, this is, you had a personal relationship with God. And that's something that God is trying to share with every individual that I'm here. No matter what you're going through, come on. No matter what you've been through, but I'm here. But listen, <clears throat> and and here, I see in your book the battlefield of the mind. Mm. And so many times that you know, John ten and ten says, "The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy." Mm. The devil is constantly attacking the mindset but yet God is yet also speaking and you know that old song that we used to sing yield not to temptation <laughs> I want to sing with you yield not to temptation you know, I, I ain't gonna go there I ain't gonna go there stick to preaching stick to preaching <laughs> but the but the battlefield of the mind talk to him one of the things about the battlefield of the mind is sometimes we don't know it's a battle because your mind has been consumed mm -hmm. with one side of the battle. Mm. And the thing about the battlefield of the mind is to show you how the enemy works on your mind. The battle starts in your mind. The Bible says, you read out the message of the a Neutral Living Translation, that an idle mind is the devil's playground. Yes, sir. Well, why would an idle mind be the devil's playground? Because you're idle in what God is telling you to do. Hmm. So it's not so much you idle in doing, you're idle in doing what God is calling you to do. And when you're idle in that, you become the playground of the enemy. Because what's in you, uh, your mind is cultured or engulfed in the things of the world. That's why when any time, um, any time, you think about things, it's always leading to you away from God and not th towards the things of God. So the battle of the mind is what has already settled on your heart. For out the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart and the mind is connected. So when God was telling me about it's some issues with our minds, it's an issue with our thoughts, and the problem of the streets, you can't get out of that way of thinking. How can you get out of that way of thinking? You you you've been brought up in this. You've been you you the very things you listen to and it increases those thoughts, enhances those thoughts. The things you watch on TV. You wonder why uh you struggle is because you keep feeding your mind these things and it keeps selling on your heart. Now that's where you were back in the projects. I was man, come on, I'm 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 fight that every day. Okay. <laughs> come on. Because the in Ephesians chapter six he says that the enemy throws flaming darts. He says you must lift up the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy. Well, what is flaming darts? The flaming darts are the very things that keep our minds set afire. He throws those very thoughts. Have you wondered why when you sit somewhere and thoughts come to your mind or 
or how you've been th been trained in your mind to handle a situation. You always lean back on those thoughts. And every time you lean on those thoughts, it always manifests something out of your life and leads you to a place God would never have you. So let me ask you, with the person that's listening right now that that's going through this with thoughts going through their mind, how do you learn to trust in him? Mm, that's a good question. How do I learn to trust in someone I don't see? Mm. How do I learn to trust him? And the first thing you have to do is, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. Mm -hmm. Well, the issue with denying yourself, you don't think, we don't think we need to be denied. We're proud of who we came to be. And sometimes I don't even understand where my thoughts are taking me. And the first thing with anything, when it comes to trust in God is to strip yourself of yourself. Mm -hmm. Consider what you know to be nothing and allow him to teach you something. And that's the problem with us is Every time it goes to a situation, every time it goes to this, every time it goes to this, every time it goes to me picking out my mate, I think I know. And that's a scary place when you think you know. Because when you think you know, the situation only shows you how much you didn't know. Right. So what if, what if from the get-go, what if from the start, I just strip myself of I don't know. Lord, I don't know how to date. Lord, I don't know how to treat my wife. Lord, I don't know how to handle this situation. I don't know how to be a better coworker, a father, a mother. I don't know that. And when you strip yourself that you don't know that, you say, Lord, teach me so that I can now know that. That's the first thing I would tell anybody when it comes to putting your trust, first strip yourself of what you do trust in. We have a few more minutes. You have shared with us, you shared with us quite a bit. But what I love about this is, and this is something that many people go through. We hear about healing. We've heard about how other people were healed. But there are some people that are afraid that they can be healed. This is in your book, chapter 31. Yes. Explain to us, in chapter 31, what you mean by afraid you can be healed. You notice that that's the last chapter in the book. So after all that God has said, there's still a choice. Mm -hmm. And I tell everybody because fear is the very thing that fights against your faith. Fear can create an atmosphere and have you live in it. Hmm. It's something that's not real. Remember I said what we think is real is really not real. It's based on fear. Some, a lot of things we have is rooted in fear. I do this because I'm afraid that this won't work out. I'm afraid that if this don't happen, that's why I have plan A, B, C, D, and E. And God is not in either of those plans. If this thing with God don't work out, it's because we're afraid. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about being afraid is we're afraid to be healed. We're afraid that God can actually change my life. I'm afraid that this marriage can actually work. I'm afraid that what God, what I, how I see my life, there's something greater for my life. And I'm afraid of the unknown. I'm afraid that if I actually let that go and that's all I've been dependent upon my whole life, then what? I'm afraid of that unknown. I'm afraid of that area that I have yet to see. I'm afraid that God can actually use me. Hmm. If you knew my life and what I've been through, how can God use me? And I'm afraid that he actually can use me. I'm afraid to be healed of that molestation that happened to me when I was younger. Hmm. I'm afraid that's all I knew all my life is hustling. I'm afraid that I've been abused. I'm afraid of all these things in my life. And I'm afraid that God can touch me and use me when I can't see myself used. I can't see myself healed. I can't see myself get past this suffering. I'm afraid of what's on the other side of the suffering. And that's what the chapter is about, that you don't have to be afraid. You know you're afraid. Let's, let's admit that. Let's confess that. And now do 
can we give that to God and let him show you what you can't even see in yourself? Because sometimes the mind be so much of a stronghold that I can't get past my own thoughts. I can't see myself past my struggle. I can't see this thing getting better. I can't see my life because I've been in the gutter for so long. How can I ever get out? And that's what it is about that fear, addressing that, that you can be healed. You're afraid and it's okay to be afraid. That's why God said, let me show you of a spirit that I did never give you. And the only one that can deliver you is the one who is over fear. And that's through God, through faith. But I'm just asking everybody in the book, everybody, whatever street you're on, will you just believe? So if it's the street of addiction, if it's a street of that bad attitude, if a street of whatever it is inside of you, that street of that past that you keep going down, whatever street you keep going down, whatever keeps calling you, can now God have your ears to listen? San Antonio, global listeners, you've heard it. You've heard it for yourself. Pastor Antoine Piper, pastor of Destiny Center, house of worship right here in San Antonio. Well, on the outskirts of San Antonio in Cibolo, Texas. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> D.C. how? <laughs> Through Jesus, of course. All right. <laughs> I like that. D.C. how? D.C. how? Through Jesus, of course. How else we gonna do it? I mean, come on, how else? I love it, I love it, I love it. Give the address of the church, if you will. Uh, the church, 108 Clapboard Run, Cibolo, Texas, 78108. Come Damn. out and fellowship with us, 930 to 11 on Sunday mornings and every Tuesday Bible study from 730 to 830. And your social sites? Uh, DCHowChurch.com You'll find us up on that website Again that's DCHow D-C-H-O-W Church.com And you can type us on Facebook We update every, all the time on Facebook Live um, And also you'll see the Bible uh, The Bible study and ser Sunday sermons on the website You can download them for free Come on now for free F R O on YouTube See look at that YouTube and also on YouTube DC How Destiny Center uh, page and is there a number that they can reach you? Yes, 214-598-1690. Again, that's 214-598-1690. You can call at any time for directions or call any time for insight or get a copy of the book. Again, that's 214-598-1690. And we do a morning medicine every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7 to 7.30, well, 7 to 7.20, and you'll find it also on the face, DC How Facebook page. And I'm just going to try this to see if it works. DC How? Through, Through Jesus, Jesus, of course! <laughs> to the T, and you're listening to the number one station in the nation with Ambassador Lockhart, Ram of Gospel Express, with KROV FM. Stay tuned and be blessed. Be blessed. This is National Recording Artist Everett Drake, and you're now on board the Rama Gospel Express with Ambassador Lockhart, reaching around the world on KROVFM.com. Now, amen goes right there. <laughs>